put us together and work on it. But you learn quickly that that you develop your strategies and you're an honest and open person and people will warm up to you because you are who you are. And I think that's what's made it... Uh, in, at the beginning, if I knew that, because I was so worried, how oh, like, they're going to listen to me on the... But they, it, you, over time, you, you learn that and you develop your own way of working with people. And we did do that. I remember in a philosophy course, we had to develop our own philosophy on how we would deal with people. But that was a pen to paper. It wasn't in the real getting into the trenches and doing the <laughs> real work. But uh, you learn that. And, and it, it is scary. I know when, when I first started out, it was really scary. But over time, you learn that, you know, you... you you are supporting people and you learn that over time that you know you can help those who want to be helped and you do your best and uh, hopefully things can turn around with people but if they don't you know deep down that you've tried everything you can so Fabulous. okay that's great thank you my name is Natasha Pasiga um, N-A-T-A-S-C-H-A Pasiga P-I-C-I-G-A um, I'm a child youth counselor at Hospital for Sick Kids in their inpatient um, child and adolescent psychiatric unit. Um, my role is to, we work mainly with uh, the entire family. Um, we encourage the family to be there at all times to, in order to keep it consistent um, with whatever we're modeling and teaching to the child we want it to be maintained at home. Um, so basically um, when I'm working on the eating disorder side of the unit, um, we do meal support with, uh, the, with the kids. Um, they experience a lot of anxiety around eating and around mealtimes, so it's a lot of processing around their emotions, their feelings, how can we make it easier for them, distraction, um, using any kind of techniques to make it a positive experience for them, and um, pretty much that's during the day. Like they have their breakfast, snack, lunch, snack, dinner, it's pretty much all around most of the day it's meal time. That's, that's pretty much it. And um, in the downtime, they, we do have a school program where there's TDSB teachers that come in during the day and they provide them with their work and they are able to receive their courses um, during the day. We also run groups um, on body image, uh, groups on emotions, feelings, um, those kind of things throughout the day. Um, and in the evenings, it's basically family time. We encourage a family to be there as much as possible. Um, so that we, like I said, we can teach the parents alongside teaching the kids how to uh, manage their eating disorder. I also work on the crisis and psychosis side where we have inpatients as well as outpatients. While the inpatients are there, um, we do, it's called a safety workbook and it's a series of questions. It's a huge workbook that um, they, they answer questions on depression, anxiety, anger, sadness, family functioning, and when they're done each section, we process it with them to kind of get a better understanding of what they're going through. Um, they also, we do working family visits in the evening, and it's a therapy session, but it's more of a discussion group. Um, it's to encourage communication. Um, through working with their workbook, there's common themes that come up, and that's what we touch on in the working family visits. And that's when it happens every single night at the same time, and it's like a therapy session. Um, we also, um, they do classroom work as well um, when they're finished their work, but, but it's mainly a short-term, like they're, it's a short-term stay. The eating disorder patients, it's a very long-term. It can be anywhere from a month to, we've had six months, nine months, depending on um, how low their body weight is and how they're functioning. But with the crisis, it's basically like a one week, very short-term. Basically we wanna, um, we wanna work on coping mechanisms. We wanna work on a safety plan for at home to make sure that it's a positive discharge for them. Also on top of that, we have patients that come in on the crisis side um, who are, uh, who have bipolar, manic depressive, schizophrenic, schizoaffective disorder, all kinds of different mental illnesses. And it's more of a long-term admission where we're observing them, we're getting them on the proper medication, working with the family to figure out a, a good plan for them, for them to deal with and manage their illness. That's pretty much, it's quite in depth. <laughs> with the eating disorders, it's, um, they're at such a low body weight that their brain is not functioning where it should be. They're making bad decisions, um, whether it be being promiscuous, um, whether it's just, they're overall not eating 
is enabling them. They're not able to be in school. They're, the lack of energy, the anxiety is so extreme that um, they're showing a lot of behavioral um, challenges. Um, in terms of the crisis patients, when we have patients that are, that are severely depressed, they do not leave the house. They've secluded themselves from everyone. Um, they've no longer spending time with their friends. They're no longer able to be in school. Um, those kind of things are the main, main things that are causing them to be admitted. Um, but it's, it's the body weight. It's low body weight. Most of our eating disorder patients have, they've gone to their family doctor and things were, their, low, their body weight, or their heart rate was so low that they had to be admitted because they were medically unstable. And from there, um, a lot of them have OCD. Um, a lot of them have a lot of rituals that aren't, that they're having to perform that are enabling them, or not enabling them to be able to function in their school environment, in their home environment, and those kind of things. So right, right. We're involved from the very beginning. Uh, Sick Kids is a very, it's a team environment. Um, it's a very team focused um, approach. We have nurses, doctors, psychiatrists, social workers, CY, we're called CYCs. Um, they wanted to give us a more professional title. So we're not called child youth workers. They wanted to, they wanted to be child youth counselors. I think we're seen as non-threatening. Um, a lot of times a doctor will walk in, a nurse will walk in, and they, the patient freezes. Like they just, they don't want to open up. But we spend so much time with them and we kind of, we get down to their level. We, the way, like, we go in their room and kind of, it's very informal. Like, we'll walk in and just be like, so what's going on? Like, what do you, you know, what's been going on with you? And, you know, how can I help you? And what, you know, you, you bring in a movie with them into the room and all of a sudden they open up because you're while in in the process of watching the movie like themes will come up and we were t we're trained to use those little opportunities that you get for for them to open up we color with them we draw with them we do all kinds of arts and crafts and they feel comfortable around us because we're just we're observing them but we're also I'm not saying we're we're, we're like a friend to them but they see us as as a friend I I guess I'd say um we just, we spend so much time with them. We use humor. We, humor and, what else do we use? <laughs> um, you talked about how do you use yourself? How do you build that, rela like that relationship? Because our work is so relational. I talk about my own experiences. Like a lot of times I'll, look, I'll say, yo, when I was young, this is what I went through. I went through the exact same thing as you, and this is how I dealt with it and how I managed. And then they right away start opening up and like, well, this is what happened, and I don't understand. My parents are like this and that. And I, I just kind of look back and I say, I talk about my own experiences and I share and very openly about what I've went through as growing up as a teenager and my own body image issues and kind of um, generalizing with them and just helping them understand that it's a part of growing up, that we all go through things and unfortunately a lot of us don't have the supports around and we don't have the positive, we choose, I guess, friends that are not as much of a positive influence on us. Um, I just say that at that age it's a very influential time in their life. and. Um, that unfortunately, like things like the media, um, all kinds of different things are big influencers and parents and expectations from parents and whether it be parents having too high expectations or parents not being around for them to support, that's a huge, like we see it every day when we're at sick kids. There's parents that are there every single day with their child to support them and to learn with them and learn how they can help them manage and cope with their illness. And then we have parents that just don't even bother coming. And so sometimes we walk on the unit and we feel like we're parents to 13 different kids. You know, they walk on, they come running over to you and that's how we see that we've built that relationship. And you go from there and like you just, um, we're also a very culturally sensitive um, environment. We, we have a lot of um, patients that come in from all over the world. And so we have to, we try to adapt and let them adapt with, like with, a lot of them have rituals like prayers and things around mealtimes that we try to incorporate in our day-to-day -day work with them and the, you just see the appreciation from them and it makes the kids feel more comfortable. And just allowing them to bring things from home that kind of make them feel like they can be themselves and they're comfortable there in the environment. And it's just the approach you use with them. Like I've always just, been myself like I haven't 
I'm not strict, I'm not firm with them unless I really need to be. Um, try to keep it more casual with them and they, they're a lot more willing to open up and share when they know they're not being judged and you're not being threatened, so. Excellent. On a day-to-day -day basis, we are working with parents all day long. Um, I've worked in many different areas in the child youth work field and this is by far the most parent, parent work of all of like my experiences. Um, we have a lot of difficulties with um, parents having two different parenting styles. We have one parent who is very authoritative um, towards their child. So if, it's, if there's a child doing, I have an example, um, doing male support with their parents and she's anxious, she screaming, yelling, doesn't want to eat her food, talking all about her body image and whatnot, and the father would tell her, you're going to sit here until you're finished your meal. And uh, kicking, screaming, and he's being very authoritative. And then the mother, um, who's very passive, um, is all of a sudden, oh, let's go talk about this. How are you feeling? Like, let's go to your room, and we can come back here later. And there's so many clashes with parenting styles. Then we have parents who do a lot of splitting with the staff. We have a care plan that we develop for a specific client and the mother's on board with the team and um, say in a day-to-day -day basis like each hour of the day is planned out just for consistency for the patient, for the team, so everyone knows what we're supposed to be doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And we have a care plan where the mother knows exactly what we're supposed to be doing and goes behind our back and doesn't follow through with the care plan. And then the patient, it causes anxiety in them and they're like, well, my mother said I could do this and you, you don't, you're not my parents so you can't implement this. My mom says this is okay and it's a constant battle. Um, most, a lot of our parents, they don't wanna be the bad cop. We end up being the bad cop. Like it, it translates to that to us. Like we have parents who just don't, they don't wanna stand up to their child. They don't wanna discipline the child. They don't wanna, provide consequences because they don't want they they don't want their child to hate them they don't want their child to um, be upset with them for bringing them into the hospital the, one of the most common phrases we hear on the unit is I can't believe you made me come here you you made me come to the hospital I hate you I don't want anything to do with you you don't love me and that's on a day-to-day -day basis that's constantly what they're saying and so when we try to implement a plan and try to help the parents um, I guess be tougher and be more authoritative with their child. They're hesitant to because they don't want they don't want to form a negative relationship with their child. When really we're trying to like we do a lot of therapy sessions with them in the in our working family visits. It's about you're the parent, you set the standards, you you lay down how you want things to be, and instead of the child running the show. And a lot of times that's that's what happens with like on our on the crisis side when we're working the, with the patients. We have kids that just they don't follow rules and they because their parents don't enforce them and they're afraid to and um, a lot of parents are too busy and there's a lot of um, parents that are divorced and it's the child are being shuffled from one family to the next so it's inconsistent parenting and it just creates upheaval in the child's life and um, dealing with your own emotions um, when you're presented with uh, patients who um, you feel so bad for them for what they're going through. We have patients that are in restraints because um, our policy is if they're being unsafe to themselves or someone else, um, we, they're placed in restraints and parents have to agree to it. Um, and to see this child who's in restraints and you, wanna, you want to help them and you want to, you want to help them and you want to keep them calm and you want to help them understand that this is for their benefit, this is for their safety and you want to keep them safe and for them they just don't understand that. And the biggest challenge with, with us is we, um, when you have a patient who is lashing out at you and swearing at you and spitting and kicking and just saying the most awful things that you've n you never thought that someone would say to you, to just remain calm in that and empathize with them and just to understand that they're going through something and not take it personal because it's very hard like we're we're in we're in a most of us that are that are in um in the field like i find that we're sensitive we you know we we want to help like the main reason we're in the field is because we want to help and we want to um 
give them the most opportunities to be successful and to overcome their challenges. And it's really hard when you're, you're doing the best you can and you feel like nothing you do is good enough because you know you you leave for the day and things are great and you you know you form that connection and you come back the next day and you walk in and they're swearing at you and they don't want to see you and they want nothing to do with you and they hate you and you're like but we just had such a good day and you know you you just you try to do the best you can and um but from my experience you know you go to work every day you do the best that you can and eventually it's going to pay off and you know, when they're discharged and you get the cards at the end that are like, you're the best in the world and thank you for helping me. And, or you see them on the street and they run up to you and, um, you know, parents come up to you and they praise you and it's all worth it in the end. But I'd say one of the biggest challenges is just not taking it personally because it's, it's really hard to, to go through those, like those extreme, out, like experience those extreme outbursts with them and, um, if it's a lot of times it's it's not just one day it's every single time you come into work and most of our patients are have extreme anxiety and the, a lot of them are extremely violent and just kind of keeping the boundaries that's it's huge um, making sure that you know you have someone pre present with you or the doors open and because you never know what like we've had patients that have made allegations against us and you got to kind of watch out for yourself. That's one of the most important things and take care of yourself and use your staff, use supervision, like talk with the people that are around you and um, you know, that's, that's what your managers are there for. That's, they're there to support you and your staff are there to support you and I'm lucky that we have such a positive um, supportive team that we work with. So if like anything goes on, if we if we have a code that's called where like like um, the patient's being extremely um, is extremely agitated and extremely aggressive, like within seconds the whole team is there to support you, and it's all about supporting each other and kind of working through it together. So perfect. Thanks. No problem. That's great. Okay, my name is Paul Pereira, uh, P A U L P E R. E-I-R-A, and I work at St. Joseph's Health Center on the Child and Adolescent Psychiatric Unit. Uh, my name is Catherine Sloss, K-A-T-H-E-R-I-N-E, S-L-O-S-S, -S -S, and I work at St. Joseph's Health Center in the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Program. Well, we work in the inpatient unit uh, with children, youth, and families, and we also play a role in the emergency department conducting psychiatric assessments of patients that are coming in and require um, emergency crisis assessment and treatment. Yeah, so a lot of the work is the day-to-day -day. in terms of the shift. Um, we're each assigned a patient as well as the nurses, so it's managing uh, the patient throughout the day, supervising the classroom, supervising mm -hmm. mealtimes, mm -hmm. uh, as well as supervising visits and so forth. So mm -hmm. it is a locked unit, so it's a formed one facility. Mm -hmm. um, so we get student, or sorry, patients that are quite mm -hmm. uh, intensive um, in terms of mental health and issues. Um, so safety is really key on the unit, so being a big part of that as child and youth workers. And also working uh, with a multidisciplinary team, mm -hmm. so we work with, alongside psychiatrists and social workers, uh, as well as nurses. And a teacher. And a teacher, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I, I think a lot of young people come because something in their life is not working anymore. Mm -hmm. So something is breaking down, whether it's their relationship with their family, um, their school uh, achievements, their academic um, success, something is, is not right. And uh, we see a lot of kids with anxiety, depression, suicidality, mm -hmm. um, some bipolar disorder and, and psychosis. So it really, something is not working and something is um, making them be in a state of not being able to be anywhere else and needing that safe and containment yeah. and, and support. Yeah, and more so. recently we've seen a lot of, st of patients that come in with drug-induced psychosis, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, with using substances and that brings on whether they're predisposed with mental health issues and mm -hmm. that really brings it to the surface. Um, so we're having a lot of patients come in the eMERGE presenting yeah. um, with, with such. So when they come up to the unit, it's usually about three days, yeah. uh, three to four days usually before they're clear uh, in terms of their mindset and thinking patterns and so forth. Um, but like Catherine said, it's, mm -hmm. you know, they come in and they like sometimes start them on medication. So you start to see some changes in terms of the behavior and it's really supporting the student with, or sorry, supporting the patient uh, with mm -hmm. that in terms of how they're managing mm -hmm. and so forth. Yeah, for sure.
I think it's very different for us. Yeah. It's pretty defined, but we also had to define it. Absolutely. Like we had to yeah. really advocate for um, what we do. I mean, our medical director is very aware of child and youth workers and gives a lot of credit to our profession, I would Absolutely. say. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but we, we also stand alone in terms of um, working with children and youth and families. Uh, that's Our experience and our training is very different than what nurses get um, in terms of working with children and youth and families and um, different than what social workers would do and psychiatrists so really yeah. we're we're an advocate for the patient mm -hmm. um, and, and that's our, our main focus but we we have so many skills that we draw on while we're working on the unit as well yeah. that other disciplines don't have it, mm -hmm. it but it's complementary to their work as well sure so yeah. in terms of like facilitating treatment groups mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um, doing a lot of individual work with the students, so a counseling session perhaps in terms of how they managed in a family session and like yeah. Catherine spoke of really advocating for them even prior to a family session or prior to a meeting, yeah. really supporting the patient in terms of points that they want to present and how they're yeah. going to manage in terms of the meeting. Um, and I think the CYWs are really quite new in, in terms of the hospital, I think really in the last Mm -hmm. five, six years, I would say, that it's becoming a bit more predominant mm -hmm. um, with different, different mental health um, units as well as different day programs that are throughout the hospitals. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes the challenge is it, it, when, when we're on shift, it's two nurses uh, and one CYW. So I think it's, for the most part, I like to think our team is, works quite well, but it's kind of, it, it's almost like every shift could be a little bit different in terms of the dynamics of the team. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are other challenges still in terms of, still being a new discipline in the hospital with, you know, in terms of being a CYW. Um, you know, I'd like to think that we do manage to get the respect and so forth that yeah. it is given to us, but it's still kind of like Catherine's talked about, really wedging your way in and, and, mm -hmm. and I think others trying to figure out what our role is and what is it that we actually do. Yeah. Um, and you, for the most part, I like to think our team is quite positive and, and supportive of us yeah. um, with what we do. So I think that's kind of an ongoing challenge in terms of really cementing our place, uh, especially in a hospital setting. Yeah, like I think when we first started at the hospital and uh, we were working the Emerge and, you know, constantly people, like, who are you? Yeah. What do you do? What do you? And then so you'd explain, you know, I'm here uh, for this young person who's come in and now very much the Emerge is, where's the, where's the child and youth worker? Where's the child yeah. and youth worker? So it's taken a long time um, to break the medical model mold, I think, Absolutely. and to, to find our place in it because it was a place where doctors and nurses and and, and, and medical personnel, and, and we are part of that, um, but we've really had to um, continue to advocate and explain, yes, I am a child and youth worker, and here's what we do, and yep. here's our role. So, I mean, there's so many, so many patients that stand out for us, I mm -hmm. think, um, across the 11 years now yep. that we've been working at the program, and um, some some happy, some sad endings, yeah. I guess, is, is that. But it's, I think it's really rewarding when you see them come from a, a really terrible illness. Like when, when you think about bipolar disorder um, and you think of uh, one of our young ladies who was um, a university student and bright and um, had much, much potential and uh, was afflicted with bipolar disorder, became very psychotic, very disorganized, um, was very violent with, with our staff team and, and a lot of work needed to be done mm -hmm. um, in order to keep safety and, and security as, as number one. But as she became well, to see her reclaim her life and, and her wellness, it was just very, very powerful. And to know that she's still in touch with us and can drop by the unit and and say hello and yeah. hearing stories is really, yeah, it's something very valuable, I think, yeah. to us. Yeah. And the big piece is going in, especially, you know, if, if you're on a full timeline is, is the day in, day out. And if you're, um, and I find sometimes mm -hmm. perhaps the CYWs sometimes are given more of the behavioral challenges when it comes to patients. Mm -hmm. um, other patients might have medical needs that the nurse uh, needs to specifically address and work with them. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's really, you know, working with each other and really tagging each other off in terms of, you know, breaks and so forth. But mm -hmm. the day in, day out, and, and like Catherine's talked about, that's an example of a patient who was there four to six months, mm -hmm. I believe. It's, mm -hmm. you know, in some of our patients, although they're short term, it's a short, um, short term stay unit, we have a lot of patients that are there for months and months and months. So whether it's a, a custody issue outside, whether it's a safety issue, um, or just in terms of the mental health piece, that's really not clear. So I think it's really in terms of managing yourself and taking breaks when, you know, when necessary and, and the yeah. key being safety for sure and really utilizing the team. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's all right. <laughs> <You're> right. Perfect. <laughs> okay. 
I think it probably goes back to even being in grade school. I've always been, uh, you know, I've always rooted for the underdog. And I think oftentimes a lot of, of the kids that we work with um, are generally labeled as such. Um, and most of it, I think, has nothing to do with, you know, it's not their fault. It's the circumstances that they come from, um, whether it's family, whether it's mental health or whatever it might be. Um, so I just am a firm believer in advocating for them and making sure they have opportunity um, like everyone else does and making sure that, you know, the labels aren't there. So I oftentimes will correct, you know, students that I work with now in terms of, say, referring to someone as, you know, even my kids at, at the hospital, they're the substance abuse kids. And I said, well, no, they're the students in the substance abuse program. Um, I've always thought that was really important to not put those labels on and, and, and the message that I often give them, um, you know, being a teenager is difficult. Um, but it's even more difficult when you've got everything else on top and you've got people that are, you know, kind of outlining all these issues and concerns. Um, but I often remind my students that it's a really short time and a, hopefully a long life. Um, so really, it's an opportunity for them to make change and, and, and move on. So I think that's really, really important to give them that opportunity and give them that chance. Now, what's your role um, in the unit? Um, I'm actually pretty lucky and fortunate, especially in a hospital setting. Um, my particular program is a, is a CYW-driven program. Um, so I really am in charge of everything from doing intakes to uh, patient care, doing treatment groups, working uh, with parents, supervising the classroom um, versus other units and, you know, that it's really, you know, a, a medically driven program. Um, although we do have medical uh, component. We do have a, a, a pediatrician that does work uh, with our program. Uh, primarily, it's myself and another child and youth worker that really do run the show, um, which is a pretty fortunate place to be in. Uh, it's a